Holy Spirit. Amen. Today we uh, are concluding the Coptic year. We're almost there, it's two weeks, and then uh, this month will finish, and we have one more week in the small month, and then we'll be ending the Coptic year. Toward the end of the Coptic year, we have the fast and the feast of St. Mary. This is the season. Here, we have a gospel. There's just something for us to remember and put in mind. Sunday gospels are all about Jesus. It's all about the Lord. So it focuses on him or on his father or on the Holy Spirit. Today, we have something new that's different. This, this week, gospel is a little bit different. It has at least half of it on St. Mary. Not only that, last night we read the whisper about uh, St. Mary too. When a woman from the crowd said to Jesus, Blessed is the womb that carried you and the breasts that nursed you. This was last night. And today we hear that St. Mary and his brothers, his brothers, the brothers of Jesus, are at the door because they said to him, uh, then his brothers and his mother came and standing outside, they sent to him calling him. And a multitude was sitting around him and they said to him, look, your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. And today I wanted to take that chance to clarify something because people sometimes think, oh, Jesus have brothers. Yes, we do have, we do not know that. Uh, the so-called brothers of Jesus are mentioned many times in the Gospel and also in the book of Acts and also in the letters. Who are the brothers of Jesus? So, as an Orthodox Church, we have a very strong tradition about the virginity of St. Mary. You know, you have an icon of St. Mary and in, on the icon usually there are three stars. Sometimes we hide one of the stars by the head of the Lord, but they ha she has three stars on her clock. And then you ask an iconographer, the person who, we don't call it draw or paint, who writes the icon, he says, I am telling you a story. I'm giving you a dogma, a faith. That St. Mary, the three stars, was virgin before, virgin miraculously during, and virgin miraculously after the birth of Christ. And then we get, I get to hear it a lot since I was a child, said who, the gospel speaks about St. Mary having other kids. We hear about uh, the brothers of Jesus. In Egypt, it's a little bit difficult, like the West, to understand what does it mean to be called a brother or a sister. In Lebanon, Syria, and maybe Iraq too, in that area, brother and sister is a different, has a different meaning. It's a different connotation. You can ask anybody that you know, Syrian or Lebanese, and say, what does brother mean in your culture? For example, in the Gospel and in the Old Testament too, Abraham called his nephew, we know that Lot is the son of Abraham's brother. We all know that. Because it said this in the history of Abraham, in the story of Genesis, he says, he took with him his wife and his brother's son, Lot. When they came to a dispute and the servants of Abraham and the servants of Lot were fighting, Abraham took Lot aside and said, why should we go into this dispute? Aren't we brothers? Aren't we brothers? There was no surprise in mentioning that Lot and Abraham are brothers, although he is not really physically his brother. This is something culturally different than what you and I understand. So let's go into this. So we solve this puzzle, this riddle. And we know for sure that as the church had held uh, on tradition, our church goes all the way to, all the way to the first century. We have St. Mark, who preached to us the gospel, who had lived in Jerusalem, had, was with the Lord and with St. Mary. And since St. Mark, 
We have other, other preachers and other uh, evangelists who came to us and, and spoke to us. And we know the story, and the story has been passed on. Um, nearby here in UNC, uh, I keep hearing his name a lot, as there's a guy who used to be a Christian. And um, he's a teacher of the Bible, believe it or not, at UNC. Bart Erdman, that's the name. So he gets his kids into the course. I got, got a couple of kids in the fellowship and they were talking to me. So they said, and I'm just, I'm going sidetracked here, but listen to me because this is important. So uh, he gets the kids in the course and he says, he asks a question. Who here, who among you here believe is the gospel is inspired by God? And because most of them come from the area or from the, the Bible belt, they raise their hands. We know that the Bible is inspired by God. At the end of the course, he asked the same question. And you get almost nobody raising their hands. He managed through going through what we call, they call it the, uh, uh, the manuscript criticism. They, they, they go through the manuscripts and, and have a lot of documentation of manuscripts in different places to show that there was a lot of changes happened to the New Testament. <coughs> it's very convincing. So a person come to me and says, Abuna, I'm shaken. That man uh, shook my faith in the Bible. I said, why is that? He said, because he showed us all these manuscripts and what was written on the side and how the scribes changed things. And I said, okay. It would shake someone who has this motto, this dogma, the Bible alone. It's almost like I'm standing on the Bible as one leg. Right? The Bible is one my, one my, my, uh, my one leg that I stand on. If somebody comes with a stick and hit that leg and break it, what happens? I fall. But I tell you something, I'm not only standing on the Bible because when was the Bible printed? Really? Gutenberg in the 1600s? Right? So where was the Bible before? See, this is a problem with the Reformation. This is one of the things that makes me a little bit angry. The Reformation prepared for atheism. That's my conclusion. It prepared for atheism because it summarized all our faith and our practice and our tradition into one book. And that book stands, everything stands. One that book fails, everything fails. And it doesn't fail. I'll just tell you what is the story. So before the 1600s, before the Reformation, actually, where was the Bible? How was the Bible read? Who owned the Bible? It's in the church. How many people could read? Until the 18th century, before they start like this public school systems, or they, uh, the schools open to everybody. Well, who was learning to read and write? Only rich people can afford tutors. Not too many people could read. Bibles were inscribed with uh, a lot of money. They said Bibles would cost almost a fortune, like a cost of a, a Mercedes Benz by today's standards. They were not popular, so sometimes we think this way. So how did the, how did the believers, the saints, we hear about them, St. Marina today, how did she get the knowledge of the Bible? How did the saints learn to be holy? By being in the church. Who held the, the Bible until today? The church. So before the Bible became a written word, the Bible was actually lived. It was in the life of the saints. I can tell you a lot about the Bible from watching Pope Krollos. Right? So I don't need a book. Because the Bible, before it was a book, it was a living tradition, passed on, an experience, passed on from one generation to another. And I said this, and this comforts our kids because they understand, they understand. Now, I'm not standing on a book with one leg. I'm also standing on a past experience, watching generations after generations of saints who left the Bible. They didn't say anything. Some of them didn't preach anything like St. Mary. Did St. Mary say anything? And we, we, last night we did a little bit of an exercise. We walked through the sayings of St. Mary. And she only had three talks. 
two phrases, one of them is a question, and a, a passage of prayer. That's all what we have about St. Mary. First one, um, actually four. First one, she said to the angel, um, how can that be and I don't know a man? The second time she speaks to the angel, what does she say? Let it be to me, I am the hand, I'm the maid servant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your saying. And the third one, she says, my soul magnifies the Lord, the Magnificat, the, that passage, and not even quarter of a chapter. And then the last one, the last saying of St. Mary, they have no wine. And then one after that, whatever he asks you, do it. That's, that's it. You have two to the angel, one to Jesus, one to the servants, and a passage of prayer. So how did St. Mary... I don't believe that St. Mary could read the Bible. There was not available to her. She would listen to the scribes teaching and the Pharisees teaching and the priest explaining, but I don't think she had a, a copy. She's very poor of the Old Testament. So how did they live? So that's what I would say. Our tradition says, what was passed, us, passed to us from generation to generation, St. Mary was a virgin. We know that. I don't need somebody to come and tell me, oh, she was not, she had other a husband after that. Then my next question will be, let me ask you this. Who is that man? I really want to know that man who dared to think of St. Mary as a, a wife. I need to know him. He's either crazy or braver than any other man I know in history. Because after them, the Lord started preaching and everybody dis discovered that he is the son of God. Who would, the, would be that man after the death of St. Joseph? Now let us go through this and I want just to give you that piece because, again, although we don't need it, but I do it so that you be satisfied. Let's look into this brothers of the Lord. What, who are they? <coughs> I start by, so St. Mark is going to give us another clue about the brothers of the Lord. I want to start with the Gospel of St. John. In the scene of the cross, chapter 19 of St. John Gospel, there were women standing at the foot of the cross. And now there stood by the cross of Jesus, if you read with me on the screen, his mother. See, whenever St. Mary is mentioned in the New Testament, she's called the mother of Jesus, the mother of the Lord. So his mother, and then comes the next one, and his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. He's mentioning three by name. His mother, his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Clopas. Please don't jump into conclusions, because again, the same rule applies. The mother's sister. Who is St. Mary's sister? Is that, that's a surprise. We hear from tradition that they had another girl. But there is mentioned a name. Her name is Mary, and she is the wife of Clopas, right? And when you say sister, I'm going to tell you the same thing. It doesn't mean she's the physical sibling. She might be a cousin. She might be an aunt. She might be a niece, right? Any kind of blood relation, she's related physically to St. Mary and is called a sister. <clears throat> but we know that she is the wife of Clopas. St. Mark is giving us another clue in his cross scene the scene of the cross. He's going to talk about this woman again. She, she was one of the famous women in the company of St. Mary and the companies, a company of Christ. So at the scene of the cross in chapter 15, toward the end, there were also women looking on from afar at the scene of the cross, among whom were Mary Magdalene, Mary, listen, the mother of James, the less, and of Joseph, 
and the third woman is Salome. So we know now, Mark is adding, Salome also was there. By the way, they're all relatives, maybe except Mary Magdalene. Salome is a niece, or a, I'm sorry, a cousin of St. Mary. Our tradition said also that Salome went to St. Mary to Egypt when they were running, and was, she was taking care of her in Bethlehem and also in the trip to Egypt. But here is the name of this Mary, Mary the mother of James the Less and of Joseph. So clarify who is James the Less. They call him James the Less because there was another James, the Great. Why they call James the Great? He's the son of Zebedee, the brother of John. Jesus took certain disciples with him in, in very important occasions, three of them by name. Those are called great among the apostles. Jesus intentionally took with him Peter, Simon Peter, John and his brother James of Zebedee. This James the list is of Clopas. So you, you have two James and they had to distinguish which one. James, son of Zebedee is the great because he's been with Jesus all the time. And then James the list who is the son of Clopas and he became the bishop. James the Great, who was the brother of John, was killed by Herod. He cut his head in, in the early, early times of the church, before he even does anything. Um, so James the, the Less became, he is the bishop of Jerusalem. When St. Paul talks about him in Galatians, he speaks about him. He's the one who wrote the letter, the letter of St. James. In Galatians, um, three, I think. I might be wrong. He said, when I went, St. Paul is saying, when I went to Jerusalem, I saw none of the other apostles Except, listen to this, James, the Lord's brother. He called that James that remained in Jerusalem. James, what we understood to be James the list, is the brother of the Lord. Let me go back to the gospel. So now you know who is James the list, the brother of the Lord. He is the bishop of Jerusalem. He was called as the zealous. Now I go back to Mark. Um, and then I would go to Mark 6. And here, people are wondering about Jesus in, in, in Nazareth. When the Sabbath had come, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many hearing him were astonished, saying, Where did this man about Jesus get these things? And what wisdom is this which he given to him, that such mighty works are performed by his hands? Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon. So we read about Mary, the, the wife of Clopas, being the mother of James and Joseph. So when, when you put things together, you would understand. They are calling his mother named Mary. But also, they are calling to mind important figures linked to him. And these important figures are James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon. The four brothers, the children of Mary, the wife of Clopas. We got this? So when you say the brothers of the Lord, you're not talking about siblings of Christ. You're not talking about physical siblings of Christ. They are relatives that Mary, the mother of James, Joseph, and Judas are called the sister of St. Mary as in blood relation. So that's number one. And I want to just put this in your mind and, and, and have it so that you would understand how to answer if you get the chance. You were going from the scene of the cross where Mary is described standing there, Mary, the mother of James, to Mark 6 where they name the brothers. So the link is between the mother of the, she's known. As if these names, James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon, are known to the community of the church. They know them. 
So anybody who would read this gospel in the first century who lived with them would know. Oh, so this Mary is the mother of these very, very famous men. Yes. So that's what I wanted to start with. And don't be shaken because tradition is our tradition, the capital T is correct, especially when it comes to St. Mary. It, the tradition is very, very careful. St. Mary is one of the biggest, biggest items on our menu. I'll tell you, there is no other person, I said this last night, no other person connected to our salvation and uh, the, the incarnation of Christ and our salvation like the mother of God. And that's why we had her in the most important thing. So the creed has named the name of St. Mary. The creed doesn't have any other name. There's the Trinity. The Trinity, right? Uh, that's okay. To, to dictate the history. The, the Trinity and St. Mary. And Pilate. Okay, I missed that one. But to say that always when we mention the incarnation, the coming of Christ in the flesh, we always mention the Holy Spirit and he was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and of the Virgin. And we mention she's a Virgin, the Virgin St. Mary. Now I want to go back to the Gospel of today so we can get a little bit of a spiritual, so I, I give you a little bit of dogmatic, uh, maybe a little bit of uh, spiritual I'm going to take the spiritual now and the tradition, the, the liturgical. So let us go to the, the gospel of today about St. Mary standing at the door. This is something to think about. We don't know exactly why St. Mary needed Jesus at the time. The people said, your mother and brothers are standing at the door. Apparently, Jesus was somewhere either in Galilee or went down to Judea, but he's going around talking about the kingdom of God. Wherever Jesus is, St. Mary went with him. Wherever he is, she went with him. And I'm going to say something. That wherever Jesus is, the church is. That's what Jesus is saying. He said, what is, who is my mother and who is my brothers and my sisters? And he looked around and he said, here we are. When Jesus is going around, he is expanding his home, his house, so that his mother become the mother of the church, the believers. He is giving us his mother. And people had seen this in the cross when he gave her to St. John. On the cross, when he looked down, he said, woman, behold your son. She's around him everywhere. I think of it that he dragged his mother to the cross. She was there in the upper room. The book of Acts tell us in the upper room she was there. She's part now of the church. She's an essential part of the church. She's always going to be in the church. So sometimes people tell us this. Oh, the job of St. Mary is to give birth to Christ and that's it. No. It is not. That is it. St. Mary is very essential in the church. We still keep her, our mother. We still look to her. She is there. But he is not trying to say, that's what Jesus is doing today. He's saying, my relationship with my mother now is open. It's not exclusive. Every one of us, relationship with mother is exclusive. Every one of us will be very unhappy if he sees someone calling his mother mama and then she's giving him that attention. And you feel like, okay, so, you know, that's taking my place. Accept that relationship. With Jesus, he wants that relationship between him and his mother to be open to all of us. Since the fairest miracle. It was exclusive before then. Jesus and St. Mary had this mystery. It's a mystery, if you think about it. How did they deal with each other? Knowing that St. Mary doesn't talk much. Nor the Lord. They, they, do, they, do take, they do take a lot of interest in the communication that is not words. I can see this from the, uh, the miracle of, in the wedding. What she said, and I said this yesterday, and I keep thinking about it. It's really 
it's very intriguing. It pulls you to think about this very little thing that she said. They have no wine. That's all what she said to Jesus. They have no wine. And that's it. And always when people speak very little, then you understand the communication is not done through words. There is a lot more done through un unverbal, nonverbal communication. So <clears throat> that means there is a communi communion and connection that is deep and so so profound that I don't I don't think we can get it just by asking the question and think about it for five seconds. You need to go there, and it will lead you to this relationship between the Lord and His mother. So she's following him. He wants to open this communication between him and his mother, this relationship to the church. Jesus had done this before, and he's doing it always. He had opened the relationship between him and his father to the church. And he has opened the relationship between him and his mother to the church so that the church can call his father our father. And call his mother our mother. And that's why she's going after him. Because she has a place. And today in this season, we remember her place. And we remember how connected she is to the mystery of the incarnation and to the trinity. When the angel spoke to her, he said that. He said, the father will protect you. The Holy Spirit will fill you. And the son will be born of you. She has a relationship with the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit. St. Mary is a good mother. And we are blessed and extremely enriched by having her in our life. Don't omit her from your prayers under pressure. Here is a little piece of information that I didn't say about this Brothers of the Lord business. So why the Reformation churches, the Protestant churches, wants to deny St. Mary's virginity? I hope you understand this. If you talk, some of us, I got a, a very surprising response yesterday when I was talking about, I wouldn't have never heard that uh, some people doubt the virginity of Mary. I said, no, they, they, you, will, you will hear about it as long as you live in the world we live in. Um, it is, it is the, the sickness. So why, why they are denying her virginity? What's the problem? Okay, say Mary's virgin, why is, that, why is that troubling somebody? It's historic, as I said, a little bit of history. Bear with me. In the time of the Reformation, the Catholic Church was made out of bishops, like our church. Very typical. It's the apostolic churches. The bishops were picked from monks and nuns, celibate virgins. They used to celebrate the virginity of St. Mary and stress it a lot. They say St. Mary is their model. So that the abuses that happened in the church in the time of the Reformation made the Reformation leaders hate the model of the bishops. They hated them and they hate everything about them. And because they depend on their virginity, celibacy, as a, a liver, as a pedestal to stand up on, I, I am a virgin, nobody can you know, uh, challenge my authority because I have this great... Um, Consecration. I'm at, at a higher level because I'm consecrating myself celibate. Martin Luther did this. I don't know if you know or you, know, you don't know. Martin Luther was an Augustinian monk. He was a monk living celibacy in a community of what we call Augustinian monasticism. After he declared the war on the Catholic Church, the first thing he did, he married a nun. The first thing he did to completely show everybody that this is not part of the gospel, this is not part of the true Christian life, and we need to fight it in any way, shape, and form. It went so aggressive to reach St. Mary and to say, oh, she was not a virgin. This is a hoax the Catholic Church had done so that they can have advantage over lay people. That's why this is a big deal for Protestants. A big deal but they don't know in their futile mind in their little minds that this was a human work against the church because after a while there will be no consecration and people will 
slowly, slowly leave and become. And this is, I think, is one of the biggest hits to the Christian faith. So I want us just to understand that the virginity of St. Mary is essential in our church. And it's, we are not Catholics. We have not been through the abuses of the church. We had our, our own bad history. But we didn't go into that style of abuse from the hierarchy as in the Catholic Church. And we were not part, part of this. But we do have uh, uh, virgin nuns, uh, nuns and monks. We do have uh, celibacy totally separated. We are actually separated from the Catholic Church since the 6th century or the 5th century. So we are not actually had to do anything with this conflict, but yet we venerate St. Mary's virginity and with the art tradition says, yes, she was a virgin. Just something to think about as you think about our mother, our holy mother, who we keep in the beginning of our liturgy, in the middle of our liturgy, and at the end of our liturgy, we mention St. Mary. Pay attention as you pray today. And you will see how uh, we start with Rejoice, O Mary. And we say the incarnation before the consecration. And at the very end, we have her in the commemoration of the saints and also in the priest's confession. She's in the beginning. She's in the center. She's at the end. Very strategically put in our traditional liturgical prayers. We ask her intercession and we ask her blessing as our Holy Mother who cares for us and pay, pay attention to our needs. To Christ is the glory with his good Father and who is paid now forever.